So, in last week's video, we discussed the recently released DC animated movie Superman Man of Tomorrow, and in that video, we sat down with the film's screenwriter Tim Sheridan to ask him a few questions about the film. Now, the footage used in the video last week was only a snippet of our full conversation, so I thought it would be fun to share the full interview between myself and Tim Sheridan. So enjoy the full interview with Tim Sheridan, writer of Superman Man of Tomorrow, and I will see you all at the very end of the video. So I'm joined by, uh, I'll let you introduce yourself, please, sir. Hey, Owen, I'm Tim Sheridan. I'm the screenwriter for Superman Man of Tomorrow. So what made you kind of want to make Man of Tomorrow? What was the kind of nucleus of telling that story? And, you know, when you sat, to, sat around and tried to write it, what were the different inspirations and different Superman stories that you attempted to pull from? And what was the kind of the meaning of the film, um, to you at least? Well, let me give you a little bit of background on how sort of the movie came to be. Um, so Butch Lukic, the supervising producer, was tasked with um, making a movie. Um, for DC and Warner Brothers Animation. And uh, he and I had worked together on a series called Justice League Action. Um, I kind of came in at the end of that show and um, we had a, a, we developed a really great rapport. The, the, uh, one of the producers on that show is Jim Krieg, who's a producer on Man of Tomorrow. Jim and Butch called me in and said, hey, we're going to make a, a Superman movie. Let's you know, let's talk about what kind of movie we want that to be. And, uh, and you know, instantly, I mean, we're, we all knew that we had very similar sensibilities to begin with. But right away, we knew that we wanted to sort of look at it as a, uh, as a reintroduction uh, and heavily inspired by the way that the original Donner movie in, introduced, uh, reintroduced us to Superman. And uh, since we were all such big fans of that, we thought that was kind of the most successful introduction of Superman that we had seen uh, in, 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 in the cinema. So, um, so coming from that place, then we got to sort of decide where we wanted to go. The, there was a previous cycle of movies that um, were, were, were all part of one large continuing universe of a story. And this was not going to be part of that. And so we were freed up to get to sort of make whatever we wanted to make. And we knew that we didn't want to start with the classic, you know, origin with Krypton and spending a lot of time in, in Smallville. We wanted to explore a part of Clark's life that we don't see explored as much, certainly not on screen. And that is his early days in Metropolis. And, uh, and sort of, you know, that, that time, I think we all understand, once we knew that, once we knew we wanted to do that, that sort of became the focus of the story we were gonna tell. Um, uh, because there is something about that period in one's life where you are just striking out on your own for the first time and um, figuring out your identity. Who is, you know, who are you? Who, who are you going to be? What, what kind of man are you going to be tomorrow? Um, you, know, you, have, you don't have it. You're not, it's all baked in at that point, right? You're still sort of figuring it out. I talked about it once as, you know, it's, it's like, uh, 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 it, it, it's it's like it's like you're playing at being a grown up for a little while, but yeah, until you realize, oh, this is what being a grown up really is. Um, and so to see that through Clark's life, to see that through Kal El's life, through Superman's life, uh, was a, was where we wanted to start. That was kind of what it, what the idea was. It was let's start with Act Two of Superman's life. Uh, if, if we know, we're, we all know Act One really well. So we can touch on that because it informs who he is, but let's see what he does with that. What he does with the, what he knows about how he, how he grew up. In Man of Tomorrow, he doesn't know a lot about his origins. So that made it easy to not really spend a lot of time on the origin. He comes to understand more of it throughout the course of the movie. So that was, 
the guiding light. That's where we started from. And then, um, you know, once we knew that, we started looking at different stories that already existed in the canon because, you know, nobody's going to, I, I don't believe, and I don't think any of us believe, believed at the time that we were going to come up with a wildly original take on Superman. So many, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. So many great writers and artists have brought us quintessential Superman stories and angles on Superman. And, and some, you know, very, very different, uh, you know, uh, disparate. And we thought, well, let's just absorb as much of that as we can and see where, where we go from there. You, it, we wanted to know if this was territory that was so well trod that there was nothing original we could bring to it. What we found was that, no, there was, there was, there was some stuff there, but we could play a little bit in that sandbox and bring a little bit of our own sensibility to it without being heavily compared to stuff that came before. The problem is, you know, we looked at a lot of books and um, what's interesting is seeing the reaction on social media when like the trailer dropped for the movie. Well, the trailer, because of the nature of the way movies are made, like the trailer mostly focused, mostly contained, and now that you've seen the movie, you realize this, stuff that happens in act one of the movie. You don't see a lot of act two or three in the trailer. And act one has a couple of elements that people saw and said, oh, that's from American Alien. Therefore, this is an adaptation of American Alien. And so some people who really like that story were disappointed, I'm sure, because it's not an adaptation of American Alien. Um, but, uh, but, you know, that's just how, you know, I wish there was a, 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 a warning that comes with a, with a trailer, you know, that tells you, slow down. <laughs> uh, there's, there, you know, what you're seeing is not representative of perhaps the entire film. So we, we did look at, we had another, there was another writer in one of our first meetings who is a friend of mine, a, a, a great colleague, and she said, um, uh, she said, have you read American Alien? And Butch Lukic hadn't read it. I hadn't read it. And um, uh, he, uh, Butch read it and he said, you know what I like? I like this, I like Lobo being a part of this. I like the, what they did with Lobo. Let's see if we can get Lobo in the movie. And I want to do kind of a similar thing where it's just one on one. And, uh, but you know, that book kind of does it in act three and you know, we, we needed to, to have that happen earlier based on the demands of the story. Um, but, uh, but then also, you know, Butch wasn't, I don't think Butch was as taken with the idea of the flying man costume, the, the goggles and the jacket, and, but I was because to me that's real that's on it that's you know what, what where you know does he just show up in metropolis with a suit yeah it, it reminded me of um in the original spider-man movie where tobe mcguire is wearing like the suit he makes for wrestling and you know yeah. it's the handmade it's kind of like yeah. a prototype we needed to communicate that he's still figuring it out exactly that he he doesn't show up fully formed ready to go we needed a visual depiction of you know, he's still putting the pieces together and un coming to terms with his identity. So that was a great way to do it. So I really wanted that in, in, in the movie. And I, I, so I put that in the, in the, in the script. Uh, and happily, you know, the designs came back. Everybody was really happy with the way it all came together. But, you know, that's a very uh, uh, small part of the movie. And, you know, we, we, we had a little fun where we literally <laughs> burned that costume. <laughs> burn it right off of them uh, <laughs> in, in, a, in, a, in a way that's gotten a lot of uh, attention <laughs> from, from some folks online. Um, but, you know, again, that was based on, for me, it was like, it's reality. Like, I can't, we can't have him in street clothes coming through the Earth's atmosphere and have them be fully intact when he, you know, arrives on the ground. It makes no sense. Those are the kinds of things that drive me crazy if I'm watching a movie or reading a story. So, you know, I was like, it has to be honest. If it's not honest, it's not the truth. And a Superman story should be about truth and justice. Um, and, uh, you know, the truth being the first one, there's a reason he's a journalist. Um, you know, the truth is important to us, any Superman story because it's important to Superman. 
And it's funny because there's a big focus in the film on identity and belonging and characters kind of not starting in a place we're overly familiar with, but ending up in more kind of familiar archetypes. What made you want to focus on identity so much? You know, specifically, um, one of the big questions I think the film tries to ask is who is Superman or what is Superman? But it's a, it's a theme that plays throughout most of the major characters in the movie. So what made you want to focus on that so much? I think it, well, it came out of a couple of things. First was, like I said, the, you know, at the, the period in his life where the movie is set, from my perspective now, being a few years out from you know, my early 20s, uh, I look back on that time and realize just how much of it was about understanding, figuring out my identity. And I think that's true for a lot of people. I think when you have a little perspective, you realize how much of your, certainly your early 20s is about forming your identity for yourself, understanding it. And so, so that, just because of the nature of when we set the movie, it, it made sense to be a part of it. It also helps to, to in, reintroduce Superman if you're reintroducing him or if you're introducing him to himself. Um, it's, um, it's, it, it 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 seemed like it was part and parcel for for this type of story but more than that when you sit down to write anything you know like this when you're dealing with a character or characters because let's face it Lois Lane and Lex Luthor are you know at least as iconic as as Superman Clark Kent at this point but when you sit down to write those characters and write a story with those characters, the first thing that comes to mind as a writer for a lot of us, I think, is, you know, what do I get to bring to this? What, because again, it's about the truth. The only way this is gonna work is if I'm telling the truth and the truth has to be a truth that I identify with, that I understand, that I can tell. And identity becomes uh, you know, I guess it's something that's very important to me. I guess it's, um, you know, I think about growing up the way I did and sort of what in my, in my 20s, what that, what coming to terms with my identity really meant. Uh, and, and I felt like I could bring something personal to that without, you know, imposing a logic upon Superman that isn't part of his story but I can bring some of my story to him and we can see how it plays out. I mean, you know, speaking in a very obtuse way, but let me just be very specific about it. Um, you know, I grew up in the nineties in central Florida and I was a closeted gay kid and I felt like the entire world was against me, that I was not going to be able to function in society. I wasn't going to be able to, uh, you know, live the dream of that, you know, certainly the American dream or any dream, certainly Superman's dream. Um, I wasn't going to be able to, to do that. I felt like the, the deck was stacked against me and I had to figure out how to navigate through and have some kind of a life. That's a tragic place to start from. A lot of people start from that place. And it's not just people who are, you know, LGBTQ in the closet at a certain time in a certain place. I feel like we all in our lives have felt like you're the outsider, you know, look, looking in, that you, you aren't part of whatever the group is that you maybe want to be a part of, or maybe you don't want to be a part of, but it is still, you know, a, a, a dominant group. It's still part of society. It's still part of the community. If you don't feel like you're part of the community, um, you know, it, it can be very tragic. Um, so, so feeling like, you know, taking that, what was specific for me, but sort of broadening it and looking at it from Superman's perspective, it's very easy to see how you can trace that to Kal-El's life. Kal-El is an outsider. He's on the outside looking in. The thing about him is he's got these fantastic abilities and powers um, that I think is another part of what we all feel. I mean, part of feeling like you're an outsider who's rejected by your community is 
the tragedy of that and why we feel bad about it is we don't, we don't usually think, well, that's, that's, that's right, because what do I have to offer? Most of the time we're thinking, but I have something. I have something to give. I am, I, I am a, a part of this the community and I have something to offer it. And so that made sense for Superman. It's, you know, he's got these abilities. He has this, 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 this desire to, to help and be a part of, of, of helping the world grow and, and be better. And so, so that was where I think identity became so important to the story was to look at, 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 at Clark and at where I should say Kal-El because, you know, from his perspective and say, you know, what is, and, and with a very modern look at the world, like what is the world going to think when they meet him, when they meet any alien, how are they going to behave? How are they going to react? And we see the world behave exactly the way we think the world would behave today, I believe, I think. Um, which is which is in a very negative way, um, you know, at the start, and uh, and as usual, it takes someone showing them no or telling them, you know, hey, I'm here to help. I come in peace, and then demonstrating that for people to wake up and then realize, hey, this is maybe our man of tomorrow, the the kind of man we could all be. Keep in mind too that, you know, so my story was as, you know, LGBT, you know, in a place where that wasn't welcome. You know, Butch Lukic, the supervising producer, uh, you know, he is an, Amer an American immigrant. You know, he, he has lived the immigrant story in America. And so, you know, he got to bring to the movie what, what how that, feels, being sort of feeling like an outsider and feeling like you have something to offer. And look at what he has to offer. Um, he's, you know, he's, he came from Batman the Animated, even before Batman the Animated Series, but through, you know, all of these shows. Batman Beyond was, you know, you just look at those credits, his name's all over that show. I love that show. Um, and you think about all the stuff he's brought to this, you know, in America, certainly. And, uh, and you know, he, he's, he tells a similar story, but it's funny because our circumstances are different. This is why I say that we all have felt that, we've all faced that, and if we can, if we can realize that, we're, that it's not unique and that we're all in this together and we've all experienced and felt those same things, and that even Superman feels and has felt those things and overcome them, that there's hope for all of us. And it's funny, you know, in the situation that he's in, in that film, you know, with, with Parasite and with everything that's going on, it's almost as if the, the people need a symbol of hope and Superman is kind of crafted to be that and he kind of takes it on his shoulders and he serves that purpose. And it's funny because, you know, there's been a lot of conversation over the last few years about, you know, how do we make Superman relevant? What do we do? What kind of stories do we tell that make Superman resonate with, with modern audiences? Uh, you know, we were talking off mic earlier about a quote from Neil Gaiman where he said, you know, you don't necessarily make it relevant, you make him inspiring. And essentially you you let him be on the, the pedestal he's on and then watch us try and ascend to his kind of morals and, and his values. And it's funny because I almost feel like that that notion that, you, you know, you, you see so often that like, oh, Superman's a Boy Scout, he's a character from the 30s, he's he's not cut out for the modern world or, or whatever. It's almost like the film kind of takes that as a challenge and says, no, Superman is, you know, if he's three things, he's truth, he's justice, and he's hope. He is, you know, like, like we talked earlier, he's, the, he's essentially a refugee that's trying to find his place in a, in a world that fears people they don't understand. And he, he manages to use the things that would otherwise make him a, a target and uses them as like a, a way to unite people and make them feel hopeful around him. You know, and, and one of the things that he, I don't know that we explore too much uh, in general with Superman, um, and we only barely brush against it, I think, in, in this movie, is that he, he, he has to recognize the privilege that he has. He, he doesn't present as an alien. He, he doesn't, you know, he, as far as he's concerned, he's from Kansas, you know, he, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't have to, you know, uh, uh, he doesn't, he doesn't have to face 
you know, scrutiny for what, what, he, what he looks like. The way that Martian Manhunter does, Martian Manhunter has to physically change his appearance uh, in order to not face discrimination in this, in this movie, which is tragic. Um, but, uh, uh, but, but yeah, but Superman really is gifted with an immense amount of privilege. And what makes him Superman is that he, what he does with it he doesn't just sit back on it. I mean, so does, Lex, so does Lex. Lex is the opposite side of that. He, he is um, of all, all privilege. And That's uh, a really interesting way of kind of analyzing it. It's, it's, it's all about what you do with your powers. What yeah. Lex does with his powers versus what Kal-El does with his. Um, you know, or what they do with their privilege. The film focuses a lot on kind of the humanity and the relatability. You know, for, for a movie that involves a lot of aliens and superpowered beings, it has a very kind of relatable and human center to it. Yeah, I mean, the thing about it is, you know, I, I, that's sort of, they, 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 if you're going to write a, a, a story, if you're going to sit down and tell any story, uh, you have to have a protagonist that people can identify with. It's very difficult to identify with a godlike being with powers beyond imagination. Um, uh, uh, well, it should be difficult, right? But it, uh, there's something about Superman, you know, and maybe it's because he is that farm boy from Kansas that he is he's so easily relatable. Uh, you know, as long as you handle, as long as you handle a story, right. Um, people can really understand who he is because they see themselves in him. We all do. Um, and, uh, and so, so I think with any story, you have to start from that place. So, so it, it, me, it was always going to be, and, and this was, you know, Butch Lukic, day one in our first meeting said, you know, this, I want to look at this like an indie movie. I want this to be character driven. I want to see things that we don't normally see in animation, scenes with two characters talking about, you know, coming to terms with their issues and problems that they're facing. And, you know, and yeah, there's action that you expect from a, from a superhero, from a genre movie. Um, all of that's there, but you know, we, we weren't going to rely heavily on that in order to tell the story. The story had to be more. It had to be about us as people. And you tell that kind of story, you tell any good story through the eyes of characters that you relate to and that, uh, who, you know, who have problems that they overcome. And whether they're superpowered gods or, you know, uh, reporters with questionable ethics at the beginning of their career, like Lois, uh, um, you know, uh, that's, that's, that's going to be the basis of any good story. And I, I, I think, you know, we, we were going to come, we were always going to come at it from that, from that perspective. One thing about the movie that really stuck out to me as being very interesting was the choice in kind of major antagonist with Parasite. And obviously we've seen versions of Parasite um, in media before. I think the, probably the biggest example is in the Superman animated series, who's kind of a recurring villain in that. But what you do in the film is a very different version of the character to anything I've ever seen. And it's interesting the way that one, you kind of, the kind of like almost like monstrous transformation that Rudy Jones goes under in the film. You know, I, I joked to, to someone after watching the movie, it's the only film I've ever seen that has a kaiju battle that ends with a heart to heart conversation which is <laughs> the most Superman um, ending to a, a kaiju fight possible. But I, I do just want to ask you kind of, because th there's a lot of interesting parallels between what Rudy goes through in the movie and what Clark goes through in the movie. What made you want to choose to use Parasite as a major villain in the film and what led to the way he's characterized and the kind of the ideas behind that interpretation of him? Well, that really evolved. You know, in the, in the beginning, it was simply... I, I, as I recall, it was simply, and this was years ago, so sorry. Uh, as I recall, the, the initial idea to have Parasite uh, was simply because this was going to be a character-driven story that we needed a way for Superman to solve his problems without his fists, that it needed to be about his his brains and his heart and uh and which is just more interesting to us as filmmakers uh, and so you know it also felt a lot more like you know the donner movie 
uh, perspective on, on Superman. And I remember early on, Jim Krieg uh, said, you know, if we have a motto, this was early on, it evolved from since then, but, but he said, if we have a motto for this movie, it's, this is a job for Clark Kent. <laughs> Uh, because ultimately it's Clark who solves the problem and wins the day, if you consider Clark as the conscience and the heart of Superman. Um, so, so that was, that was where, you know, where, where that, where Parasite started was, was simply, you know, we have to take his powers away. <laughs> That's where you kind of, you know, a villain like Parasite is great because you can just take your hero's powers away. And that's going to put him in a position where he's got to figure out another way to win. Well, so on a very basic technical level, that's where we started from. But then, you know, it sort of reveals itself as you, as you get into the process of writing and, and, and con, you know, concocting the story. When, when, when all the pieces started fitting, you know, was when we realized it was about not just identity, but the identity of you know, being this alien, being something that people would be afraid of, and that it was other, it was something that was to be despised because it wasn't us. And once we kind of clicked on that, then the sort of twist of, here's a guy with this enormous privilege, Clark Kent, who looks like everybody on the street, whether he puts on those glasses or not, um, and yet he's this powerful alien uh, who, you know, some people fear versus a guy who's a veteran and a hero, war hero, uh, who's, you know, got to start a family and, and has dreams and is working hard. And he's just like a, just your average Joe. And, um, but who a terrible thing happens to him in the process of trying to save people and be a hero, a terrible thing happens to him and he becomes something that appears to be monstrous and, and he, you know, acts monstrous because of the needs that he now has. But, 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 you know, so, so the, so the, the, the city and the, the people, you know, looking at those two side by side in the climax and saying, you know, one of these is an alien and a monster. And one of them is a guy that I can look up to and believe and get behind, um, you know, and it's, you know, <laughs> they, they have no idea that they're, when they're looking at that, at Parasite, that he's a hero. He's a hero and, and you know, so is, so is, so is Clark, but, but classically, Clark is the one who, who they should look at and say, you know, this is, this is somebody who is other. This is somebody who we should be concerned about. Um, happily, he demonstrates that they don't need to be. <laughs> uh, so that was the, the twist. It sort of revealed itself as we went through. And so it was like, oh, that's, that's what the heart of this story is. Again, it's about identity and not just how we see ourselves, but how we want the world to see us and how they do see us and how we can influence how they see us. So that, that was why Parasite just made a lot of sense. Yeah, I think of the scene on the bridge, especially where you've got Parasite and you've got Clark and and, and Clark, you know, he says, this is Rudy Jones. He's, you know, just like one of you. If anyone's going to be the, the person you, you know, fear and hate for being an alien, it, it's me. And that touches on, again, like the idea of the privilege that Clark has in a sense that he is the outsider that, you know, if he simply chose to, could just blend in and just live the normal life if he wanted to. Yeah, I mean, that goes directly to my experiences mm. of, you know, like I, I am part of a... a I have, I have been part of a marginalized community in my life, but when I walk down the street, nobody knows. I don't wear it on the color, in the color of my skin. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that's sort of, you know, just another sort of angle that I, I understood and could bring to, you know, the, the, you know, Superman story is that he, he, he passes and he doesn't have to tell people who he is. So, uh, so that presents him with a decision point. Yeah. And he talks about it with his mother. You know, do, do, I, do I tell them? They will hate me. Uh, and I won't be able to do the good that I want to do. Um, but am I being honest? <laughs> what, how do I, you know, do I live, can I live the truth and still, you know, be who I want to be? 
and live the life I want to live. Um, that's something I really understood. And so I wanted to make sure that we saw that in the movie. And, and, and we see that with, you know, with unfortunately the tragedy of Parasite, which this yeah. movie ultimately is, you know, it could have been, this movie could have been titled The Tragedy of Parasite. Yeah. And I, I think that's a really interesting point that is obviously there's the, the conversation between him and Martian Manhunter, like the midway point in the film where you, that really becomes evident. And it's the fact that, you know, despite Clark having all these fears about his identity being an outsider, he can choose to fit in and just be Clark Kent, reporter for the Daily Planet from Kansas. You know, he can be part of society, but it's the fact that he has that luxury that also gives him the responsibility that he has to fight for those who can't, which is quintessential Superman. I was really conflicted in the process about Martian Manhunter's position on that. You know, ideally, Martian Manhunter would say something that sounded more courageous and would say, hey, you know, live your truth, girl. Um, but he, he, he doesn't do that. And it was, it was conflicting for me because it's like, what, you know, what do I want? What personally, like my, 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 my own desires for Martian Manhunter to just say, hey world, here I am. Um, but I, you know, we needed to have that perspective in the movie. And ultimately I think it, it showcases the, the, the mixture of triumph and tragedy in Martian Manhunter that we expect from all of our heroes and their origins and their, their backstory. I mean, when you look at, 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 at John Jones in this movie and you know, he, he has lived through terrible times and, and chosen in America and chosen to present himself as a black man in a time when, probably most likely in a time when, you know, that was not uh, uh, the easiest way to live life if you could choose it in uh, America. And uh, I'm fascinated by that as sort of a decision point for him because I think it says so much about him that he would identify with a marginalized community and and stand with them that way. And, uh, and instead of taking what would arguably be an easier path in the 50s or 60s or whenever he, he, he arrived here. I think that was kind of our goal. I don't think we really communicated it in the movie, but the, the idea was that he was here and, and lived through you know, the civil rights movement and, and that it influenced sort of how he presents himself to the world and how he he believes that if you can hide Clark, you probably should, because I've seen some stuff. Yeah. Um, I think ultimately, though, he, Martian Manhunter, gets to learn something. I mean, it's a Superman movie, so you know he gets to learn something from Clark uh, in Clark, you know, essentially coming out uh, to the world and. Um, you know, and I think, you know, I, everybody learns something from, from Clark in this, in this movie, you know, I, uh, but that to me, that's, you know, maybe not Lobo. <laughs> I don't know that he learned anything, unfortunately. Lobo is so, Lobo. You just gotta yeah, love Lobo. Lobo's just gonna I do his so, thing. I was so disturbed by how easy it was to write dialogue for Lobo. <laughs> I was like, where is this coming from? Uh, just like channeling a, a dark place inside you. Yes. <laughs> yes. And some of it was even darker. Like what made it to the screen is still pretty bad, but like the early drafts, <laughs> oh man, that was some bad stuff. And, um, you know, a lot, I think, uh, I, I think, I mean, I joke about Lobo not learning a lesson, but and we don't have a line about it in the movie, but he, he actually kind of does. I mean, if you notice that he gives up on the bounty mm. at the end, he, he seems to, at least, he seems to have given up on the bounty he came to earth for yeah maybe he maybe he didn't i don't know but uh but if you consider that he did you know what would motivate him to do that and uh i, I would argue that it was it was you know that there is a kernel of good inside lobo that sees that 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 kal-el is in the right place yeah and he should be here you know is, is a really interesting group of those three characters specifically, you know, with them all being aliens, all being the last of their kinds. But then you've got Clark who is learning about his past, you know, as a young adult, you have John who essentially lived through that hardship 
And then you have Lobo who killed his species and is now a, an intergalactic bounty hunter. It's, it's a really great... It, Lobo in this film is almost like what Clark would be if he didn't have that kind of moral center. Well, they are, I mean, you know, I, I've, I've talked about this uh, before and I, I feel like I get way too deep into the weeds when I talk about this, but uh, since we're having a discussion about it, I mean, they, they, the, the idea was that to, you know, to present the, you know, the, the, the psyche of the hero in this movie as the id, the superego and the ego. And, you know, where, where Lobo represents the id, all the uncontrollable urges and desires that, you know, that, that the hero, uh, uh, you know, m impulses that they may have uh, versus the, you know, super ego of Martian Manhunter, who is, you know, very calculating and thoughtful and uh, to a fault, ultimately. He's overthought his position and the position of being an outsider and to the point where his reaction to it is maybe not healthy. Um, uh, and then you have the ego of Kal-El having to sort of balance those, those two. It's almost like those two characters who have obviously these very similar backgrounds to Clark, almost acting as like the angel and the devil on his shoulders at times. Yeah, I mean, I don't, it's hard to say that though, because, you know, Martian Manhunter, while he's a great hero, uh, you know, he, 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 you know, in, in this movie, he does heroic things. He still is is perhaps too cautious and too calculating, and and so it is. You know, by all accounts, Martian Manhunter should have emerged as the great hero of uh, of the Earth. Yeah, uh, long, long before Clark. Yes, long before, and so for him to have not done that and not been what he maybe could have been and should have been um, shows that. It, he need, it, you know, he needs to be balanced with something like Lobo, who is somebody who acts without thinking. And so that's where, you know, what Clark has to learn, what Kal-El has to learn is the balance between those two things. Uh, take action, but take thoughtful action. So uh, one final question then um, for you. Um, so like you said, at the end of the film, we kind of see the characters kind of mold into or kind of enter into the more familiar archetypes that we come to expect them. By the end of the film, Clark is kind of more, he is the Superman we'd come to expect, or at least he's very much on his way there. Johns has kind of uh, moved on from his fear and he's starting to embrace the idea of being a hero more. You know, the fact that he's there with Clark dressed like we'd come to expect Martian Manhunter. Lois is the character we expect her to be by the end of the movie. Lex is, you know, a, a rich dirtbag by the end of the movie. <laughs> Lobo is still Lobo because that's Lobo. So it's like Lex, Lex, Lex and Lobo don't necessarily go through wild transformations, uh, you know. But they, they, you know, that's what we expect from them. But in in terms of those characters, the characters that them necessarily don't change. The other characters change as a result of their actions. Like you talk about comparing Clark and and Lex based on privilege. The fact that Lex stays as the person he is is almost integral to the fact that Clark changes because that's what makes them so different. And I think that's really interesting. So obviously like, I'm not gonna quiz you on, you know, can we expect another one? What, would, what characters would you like to include? But I do want to ask is, in terms of the way you approached writing this film, especially like thematically, stylistically, and, and the meanings and like the, the big ideas at the heart of writing this film, if you were to tell another story in this universe, you know, not necessarily a Superman story, just another story in a, in a similar vein to how you approach this, are there any particular kind of ideas you'd like to tackle? Obviously with Man of Tomorrow being a movie about identity and belonging, you know, are there any other kind of themes like that that you'd like to explore more in future works? It's a good question. And the reason why I like this question is because it, it's, it, it takes into account the idea that when we did this story, we did the story about identity and coming to terms with that and embracing your destiny and who, who you're going to be. Who, it, you know, who are you going to be? Uh, you know, um, you know when, when, when does the man of tomorrow reveal himself, uh, if not today? Um, you know, so, so we've done that. I, I would say that to turn around and do a, a story that is a more classic, action-packed, going into space, dealing with, you know, dark side or whatever, like 
I feel like that would be the wrong direction for me for this this kind of uh, of story. What I would like to see, you know, is you know, it, is something that is that can explore another facet of of humanity. I can't really get into details about you know what I would want to do with that, but um, but 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 this movie was meant to be a very personal, character driven story, and I think if if I were if I were going to revisit this character, this Superman, even if it was a a shoot 'em up sort of space adventure, in that it would have to be for me to be interested in telling the story, it would have to be still a great science fiction. It would have to be about something what, you know, that I consider more. <laughs> it would have to be about who we are and where we are. I think the world right now is in a very difficult place <laughs> um, and in a very precarious place. Uh, and I think I would want to tell a Superman story that presents a level of hope for our own future in the midst of, you know, what feels like the end times, <laughs> you know, when you just open up the newspaper every day, it's just like, oh my gosh, this is just like, it, it feels biblical, you know, the kind of, the kind of tragedies and terrible things that are happening in the world. Um, I think Superman is, at his best when he represents hope for all humanity and a glimmer of what we can be in the future, what we can be tomorrow. And, uh, and so for me, if I was going to tell another story with, with Superman in this particular world, in this particular world, it would be about that. It would be something that was a shining light of, of hope to get us out of what I believe are, you know, just such dark times yeah. right now. Um, I know that's not much of an answer, but, uh, but I don't think I would, I, I think the, 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 the way I boil it down is just to say, I, I would not want to take a step backwards. I would want to use sort of this character in this world and what, that we've created to dive even further into what it means to be a human being. Uh, you know, those to me, those are the only interesting stories. Perfect. I couldn't ask for any more. Tim, thank you so much for coming on and explaining this movie with me. <laughs> pleasure. Thank, thank you, Owen. It really was people, a pleasure. Where can people get some more of you? Maybe, you know, see what you're working on or if there's anything you'd like to plug at the end of this. Yeah. The floor is yours. Most, most of the time I can't talk about anything that I'm working on. Happily, people will get to see, um, I can talk about the fact that you're going to get to see a uh, uh, a Netflix series next year that I've been working on with uh, a guy named Kevin Smith. Uh, and it's uh, He-Man, or it's not He-Man, it's Masters of the Universe, <laughs> I should say. Masters of the Universe Revelation. Um, oh, nice. So that's going to be coming out. Uh, so I can talk about that and all the other things I can't talk about yet. Uh, if you want to, you know, follow me, uh, please do. Um, it's uh, I am Tim Sheridan on Twitter. I will leave a, a link in this video's description. So please do go in and follow Tim, check out his work. And yeah, thank you for coming on it's, it's been a pleasure totally fun i hope we can do it again hey everyone thank you so much for watching today's video i hope you enjoyed it if you did please make sure to leave a like on the video and leave a comment down below as well let me know your thoughts on everything we talked about in today's video i can't wait to hear what you have to say as always i want to give a big special thanks to tim sheridan for sitting down with me and having this full hour-long conversation about superman man of tomorrow if you enjoyed listening to what Tim has to say, then I will leave links to his social medias in the description. So go check out everything he's working on. Go check out Superman Man of Tomorrow and stay up to date with all of his future projects. If you enjoyed this video though, there should be some other videos on screen right now that you might also enjoy. And if you're new to Unlikes Comics, please consider hitting the subscribe button and the notify bell so you stay up to date with all of the new videos we release on the channel. If you want some more of me personally, you can follow me on Twitter just at OwenLikesComics. And if you want to help support the channel, you can go to patreon.com slash owenlikescomics. Once again, thanks for watching this video, everyone. I greatly appreciate it. And until next time, take care and keep reading.